from the 5 Minute Medicine series on cellulitis. Cellulitis is an inflammation of skin and underlying tissues that can be infectious or non-infectious. The infectious forms of cellulitis can be caused by various microorganisms. Common infectious causes include Staph aureus, Group A strep, and other hemolytic streptococci. Some of the more common diseases that may be mistaken for infectious cellulitis are listed here. Take a few seconds to review this list, however these conditions will not be discussed in detail here. Cellulitis manifests as areas of skin erythema, edema, and warmth in the absence of underlying infectious foci like a septic joint. Erysipelas is commonly mistaken for cellulitis. They differ in that erysipelas involves the upper dermis and superficial lymphatics, whereas cellulitis involves a deeper dermis and subcutaneous fat. As a result, erysipelas has more distinctive anatomic features than cellulitis. Erysipelas lesions are raised above the level of surrounding skin, and there's a clear line of demarcation between involved and uninvolved tissue. Patients with erysipelas tend to have acute onset of symptoms with systemic manifestations including fever and chills. Patients with cellulitis tend to have a more indolent course with development of localized symptoms over a few days' time. Bursitis is inflammation of the bursa, which protects against underlying soft tissues from bony prominences and can be infectious or due to other systemic causes. This is typically located over a joint, and subdeltoid, olecranon, trochanteric, and prepatellar bursae are most commonly involved. Suspect this when swelling and erythema occurs at a site close to a body surface at one of these sites, and it seems like a fluctuant mass may be present just under the skin. Necrotizing fasciitis is a deep-seated infection of the subcutaneous tissue that results in progressive destruction of fascia and fat, but may spare the skin. It is important to recognize neck fasci as treatment differs compared to cellulitis, and there may be rapid progression from a seemingly small process to one with extensive destruction of tissue, systemic toxicity, loss of limb, or death. Features to look for include unexplained pain, blister and bullet formation, and signs of systemic toxicity. Erythema may be present diffusely or locally, but in some patients, excruciating pain in the absence of any cutaneous findings may be the only clue of infection. It is referred to as pain out of proportion, since the findings may be clinically small or inapparent. However, the patient seems to be in extreme pain. Within 24 to 48 hours, erythema may develop or darken to a reddish-purple color, frequently with associated blisters and bullet. The bullet are initially filled with clear fluid, but rapidly take on a blue or maroon appearance. Once the bullet stage is reached, there is already extensive deep soft tissue destruction such as necrotizing fasciitis or myonecrosis. Such patients usually exhibit fever and systemic toxicity. Crepitus is also present infrequently. Necrotizing fasciitis is diagnosed based on history and clinical features. The laboratory findings are nonspecific, but may demonstrate leukocytosis with a marked left shift and elevations in serum lactate, CK, creatinine, and CRP. These abnormalities in the presence of the above findings should be of sufficient concern to prompt surgical exploration. Once the decision is made for surgical exploration, it is critical to proceed with surgery rather than to delay to obtain imaging studies. Some clinical pearls to note, the lower extremities are the most common site of infection for both erysipelas and cellulitis. One common cause is due to disruption of the skin barrier, such as penetrating wounds or injection drug use. Other predisposing factors may include pre-existing skin infections like tinea pedis and edema. Lymphatic obstruction following surgical procedures also predisposes to cellulitis. Breaches in the skin may be evident and commonly is a portal of entry for microorganisms, however they may be small and clinically inapparent. Patients with cellulitis are typically not septic and do not show signs of hemodynamic instability such as tachycardic or hypotension. The presence of these signs should prompt search for an alternate diagnosis like necrotizing fasciitis. The diagnosis of cellulitis in erysipelas is based upon clinical manifestations. Cultures of blood, needle aspirations, or punch biopsies are usually not useful in the setting of mild infection. Blood cultures are positive in less than 5% of cases. Cultures of swabs from intact skin are not helpful and should not be performed. Cultures of blood, pus, or bullet are more useful and should be performed in patients with systemic toxicity, extensive skin involvement, or underlying comorbidities such as malignancy or immunodeficiency. It may be worthwhile to attempt to obtain cultures in patients with recurrent or persistent cellulitis. Consider an ID consult for these types of patients. Needle aspiration and culture of the bursal fluid is essential if bursitis is suspected. 
radiographic examination is not necessary for routine evaluation of patients with cellulitis. It can be a useful tool for distinguishing cellulitis from osteomyelitis or gas gangrene, although cannot always distinguish cellulitis from necrotizing fasciitis. If necrotizing fasciitis or gas gangrene are suspected, you should not delay surgical intervention in order to obtain radiographic imaging. Ultrasound can be very helpful to identify the fluid-filled bursa if infected bursitis is suspected. Empiric antibiotic therapy for management of cellulitis should include activity against beta-hemolytic strep and staph aureus. Patients with signs of systemic toxicity or erythema that has progressed rapidly should be initially treated with IV antibiotics. Some agents that can be considered are cefazolin and cloxacillin. If the patient has risk factors for MRSA infection, vancomycin or one of the newer MRSA antibiotics should be included in the initial treatment regimen until causative microorganisms are identified and their sensitivities are known. Most patients that develop mild cellulitis can be treated with oral antibiotics. Patients presenting with an initial episode in the absence of significant comorbidities should be treated with agents such as cephalexin or clindamycin. It has been recognized that use of cell wall active antibiotics such as the beta-lactam antibiotics, including cephalosporins and penicillins, to treat cellulitis sometimes may cause an initial worsening of signs and symptoms before improvement is seen. Clindamycin, a bacteriostatic antibiotic, has been shown in vitro to be more effective than beta-lactimes in animal models of cellulitis and is becoming an increasingly popular choice to treat cellulitis. Cellulitis resulting from animal or human bites is more likely to be caused by microorganisms other than group A strep or Staph aureus, and in these settings, broader antibiotics Antibiotic agents should be used. Appropriate regimens may include a third generation cephalosporin, plus flagell, or amoxicillin clavinolate. Cellulitis can infrequently cause sepsis, or and any of hypotension, altered level of consciousness, or lactic acidosis may suggest this. Also, spreading of the infection or development of blisters and bouet may indicate an aggressive or necrotizing process, and a senior medical resident should be informed immediately. In summary, cellulitis is an inflammation of skin and underlying tissues that can be infectious or non-infectious. It needs to be differentiated from erysipelas, bursitis, and necrotizing fasciitis as management will be affected. The diagnosis is clinical and treatment is with antibiotics covering beta-hemolytic strep and staph aureus unless other risk factors are present.